Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is novelist Christina Baker Klein. In 2014, Ms. Klein's fifth novel, Orphan Train, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed on that list for over two years. Since then, she has written two more novels. The most recent, A Piece of the World, is a fictionalization of the life of Christina Olson, the subject of Andrew Wyeth's iconic painting, Christina's World. Well, Christina, it is good to see you again. I'm so happy to be here. What a wonderful honor. The last time that I was lucky enough to see you, you were presenting a slideshow and a commentary on Orphan Train uh, across the river at a restaurant. And I don't know who your sponsors were then, but it's nice to have you back in Tuscaloosa. It's so <laughs> fun to be here. And I've never explored the University of Alabama, which is so beautiful. You are new to exploring the University of Alabama and also new to this show. And the little that I know about your biography is interesting. Yeah. All right. The United Kingdom, Tennessee, Maine. What is your, what is your, uh, what is Carolina. the sequence? And North Carolina, well, what is so the sequence of things? I am a 100% Southern. My <laughs> father is from a little town in Georgia, right next to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And my mother is from Gastonia, North Carolina, mm. which by the way, Wiley Cash, who <laughs> was here recently, um, has written a new novel about this town called Gastonia. But um, so my parents are Southern and then, and they met at Furman University in South Carolina. I have relatives living in Selma. And uh, so I have, I do have these sort of deep roots in the South. And then my dad, my parents moved to England and he did a PhD. I, my sister and I were born there uh, and, and grew up there. And then we moved to Maine because my dad took a job at the University of Maine as a historian. And so when we moved to Maine, um, my sister and I had English accents and my parents had Southern accents. <laughs> and it was a very funny situation. And I think Mainers thought that we were just from another planet. And you know? No one had a Maine accent. Well, none of us had a Maine <laughs> accent. And then I had two sisters who were born in Maine and I wouldn't even say they have a Maine accent. There was too much of a hodgepodge going on. But. You novelists don't usually do this and you don't do it either, but you're a superbly educated person. Well, Novelists on, on dust jackets, it usually doesn't say how many degrees they have, but you have a little collection from Yale and Cambridge and... And UVA, and where I went for a Master of Fine Arts, which is right. a, a writing degree, yeah. So did you go to undergraduate school in England? So I went to uh, Yale for oh, undergrad. first. And then I went to Cambridge for graduate school. <laughs> And, uh, and Cambridge is where I think I, I sort of developed the tools and the brain space to become a writer because I just immersed myself in reading for two years. And when you do a literature degree there, it's different than here. There aren't really requirements beyond immersing yourself. So I read s more in those two years than I think I read my entire life. Right. And then UVA for an MFA. Yeah, and, and you know, the truth is I was a scrappy kid because my parents were professors. We didn't have a lot of money. I had student loans. I did a work study job um, in college working for a, ma uh, a literary magazine. Uh, I worked in England uh, for Granta, which is an amazing literary magazine, yeah. but I was always working. And, uh, and so really my MFA was for me, a sort of technical degree in that I wrote my first novel in there. I knew I had two years, I got a full scholarship, so I had this fellowship for two years and I thought, if I don't write this novel now, I'm probably, I'm gonna have to repay my loans and I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'll have to take a full-time job. So that was, I was very directed. And really, MFA programs are not set up for that. You're supposed to write stories and you know workshop things. Right. And so I, I kind of fudged my way through and I just wrote this novel. My first novel. Would you have been there at the same time as as uh, Peter Taylor, George Garrett? Yes. That, that generation? George Garrett was my mentor. Of he course. was the head of the program <laughs> there. Peter Taylor was just a legend, as yes. you know. Uh, John Casey was there. Yeah. Rita Dove, who's still there. Right. There were these incredible poets, Charles Wright, 
uh, Gregory Orr, Rita Dove, as I said, and um, and so I benefited from all of that. I was, I think, um, I think actually what led me into writing in the first place was poetry. I loved uh, reading it and writing it, uh, and I still can't pretend that I understand all of it, but oh. I think it taught me a lot about language, and so I'm really glad that uh, I... Half the poets I talk to are quite certain you're not supposed to understand it. Exactly. But we'll let them go. We can talk about that <laughs> another time. Orphan Train, which was such a monstrous hit, is, was your fifth novel. Right. I have had a chance to look at the first four. I, I don't have them under control, but yeah, I have yeah. held them in my hand. They are, they are set in Maine. They are set in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. One is they, New York. New York City, where you've also lived, lived mm -hmm. and spent a good deal of time. I don't see one set in the UK. Is there, is there any setting in, in your fiction? So in, in my, my novel right before Orphan Train is called Bird in Hand, yes. and the characters all meet in England. So there, there is a sort of part, a long part about that. The novel I'm working on now, which we'll talk about later, um, yeah. is begin, has quite a bit in the UK. Right. So, yeah. One thing I did take away from the first four novels, though, is I, if I were a character in any of your novels, I would never get into an automobile. <laughs> no. Because the fatality rate point. for your characters is somewhere around 50 percent. If 10 characters go to the store in their cars, by the end of the day, five of them are dead. You know, I was Why just, is that? I was just telling, <laughs> I'm, I'm here at uh, the University of Alabama <laughs> talking to all these students, and today I was telling the students that one of the most interesting things about being a novelist is that um, critics tell you what your themes are, uh -huh. and no one's ever pointed that out, and I've never thought about that, but you're right, there have been these car accidents. Not in Orphan Train, but no. in other books. But um, it's true. And then there are other themes, like one critic said that I really like old ladies, because I've written quite a few stories about them. And oh, yeah. um, my character Vivian in Orphan Train, who's this 91-year-old woman, is modeled in part on both of my Southern grandmothers, yeah. who were great storytellers, as many Southern women are. Well, you do. It's not rare, though. A great, a great ma women who have had grandmothers who matter, those grandmothers stay with, they do. with women, and, and grandfathers stay with men, I think, in the same way. Yeah, I think that's Orphan right. Train, the, when, when you spoke about it a, couple, a year or two ago, yeah. and you had the accompanying slideshow, there was one thing that you said, I mean, the, 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 the idea of it was simple enough. There were, in New York City, homeless, orphaned, or unwanted children from infants to 12 or 14, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they were put on a train and they were sent out to, in this case, in your case, Minnesota. Yes. Where someone would not adopt them exactly, but take them in for whatever good or not so good reason. But the thing that you said that, that really stunned me at, the, at lunch when you were speaking was that some of those kids had, didn't want to go. I mean, they were sort of scooped up yep. against their will That's right. off the streets of New York. Well, you have to understand, New York in the mid-19th century was, when we think of Dickensian London, yeah, New York was yeah. really like that. There were 30,000 children living on the streets at any given time. Really? Yeah, and there were no social programs of any kind. There was no welfare, there was no foster care, there were no child welfare laws, yeah. there were no child labor laws. Children were property, which meant they had no rights, and poor children, pure and simple, were labor. And the wealthy in New York were not in the habit of giving money to the poor because poverty was considered an inherited affliction. It was like a disease. It was, right. They called it bad blood, that your blood was tainted if you were poor and that there was really nothing anyone could do about it. And, um, and the idea, it was sort of a social Darwinist philosophy that most people would die out, the poor, and some would rise and those people would deserve to integrate into higher society. Right. But this abolitionist, this social uh, reformer named Charles Loring Brace looked around in the 1850s and he said there has to be something we can do. And he opened the first big orphanage in New York called the Children's Aid Society, which filled within days. It was so, there was such a need for it that, that he it was overrun with children. 
Um, and he came up with this kind of glorified fresh air fund idea that he would, he said, if we can get these poor children off the streets um, and, and into, by the way, he was Methodist, Protestant, preferably Methodist homes in the Midwest, uh, you know? Sure. Uh, where they're expected to work, but eventually they'll be freed. It was, they were indentured. Um, surely they'll have a shot at a better life. And so it was a kind of crazy idea, but there wasn't much of an alternative, and it worked. Right. He got all these children, a quarter of a million children, he sent on trains. <laughs> he began it, and then some other people got uh, involved. Liz, I, I had no idea. You, you mentioned fresh air. I, I was partly raised on a dairy farm on the St. Lawrence River in upstate New York. Yes, well. And in the summer, we had fresh air kids from New York City. That's right. But they were only there for 30 days. They didn't send them to Minnesota for life. They, they, they just came and lived on people's farms and then went back to the Bronx or Brooklyn or wherever, wherever they were from. This is the, a lifetime fresh air kid. Well, exactly. I did, a, I did a talk in New York and there was a woman in the front row in her 90s. And when I was talking about, I showed a map, I'll, I'll be doing it when I speak mm -hmm. at the University of Alabama as well, a map of about where the orphan train riders sure, went. Sure. A lot went to upstate New York, actually. Oh. And, um, and she raised her hand and said, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, we had a farm in upstate New York. And she said, every year, these boys would get, come on a train and line up by height. She said, we always pick the strongest boys. She said, those boys had the most marvelous time laboring in our fields. <laughs> oh. And I thought, I would like to interview those boys and find out what they have to say about it. My, my memory of them is that they were, they were too little, too young, too small for serious work. They, yeah. were, they were really just fed a lot of um, uh, milk yes, and yes. pork chops and, got, and well. literally did get a lot of fresh air. That's All nice. right, here's a question which surely has has been raised a hundred times, but nevertheless, Orphan Train was on the bestseller list for, I don't know, 26, 27 months, something like that. Yeah. It's a fine book, it's highly readable, it's a nice story, I loved it, but at some point, everybody says, what, 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 why, why this book? Why, what, it, what do you think was in that book that was, so extraordinary that people couldn't get enough of it. It sold hundreds of thousands of copies, I hope. Four million copies. <sighs> I know. All right. I know. All In right. 40 countries. I'd like to repeat my question. What? <laughs> no, <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Think? Think? It's crazy. It is, you know, there are books that hit the moment and yes. they capture, there's a zeitgeist quality to it. Um, you know, you can name them. Um, the, the Glass Castle yes. and The Lovely Bones and... I, I think Amor Toll's book, A Gentleman in Moscow, for whatever reason, has captured the public imagination as well. Mm. Um, I didn't, it wasn't calculated, of course, I didn't know what I was doing, and I would never probably be able to approximate that again, and honestly, I don't need to, I don't care. Um, but but I, I do understand now something about what made that book yeah. so popular, and conti it continues to. Sure make it so. Um, I think that people are hungry for stories that have been hidden in plain sight. Um, because the truth is, our, our, the history of our, the story of our country is not the story of the poor and the dispossessed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the story of treaties and presidents and generals and robber barons and industrialists. Yeah. It's the story of the wealthy and it's the story of the the gentry, essentially. Um, stories of poor people and immigrants have been, have not been part of the official history. Right. So when I was working on Orphan Train, I went, I spent a lot of time at the Tenement Museum. So I'm giving you a little anecdote by way of explanation. Uh, the Tenement Museum in Lower Manhattan is incredible. They have uh, sort of recreated what it was like for these immigrant families. It's very authentic and you take these hour long tours. And I, I began taking, I, I began going on these different tours, and finally by the fourth one, I realized they do not mention the orphan trains. I was doing all this research, I learned that the Lower East Side was essentially ground zero for the orphan trains. I mean, most of the children came from there. They came from the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens, and, but, but a lot from the Lower East Side. And um, 
and yet nobody talked about it. And so I asked the director of the museum, why do you never mention the orphan trains? And she said, you know, I guess we just think of that as a footnote to history. We don't really okay. think that it's part of this larger story. So flash forward two years, and I get a call from the Tenement Museum saying, we are inundated with questions about the orphan trains, and we don't have anyone qualified. Can you come in and train our staff? and tell us oh. that this, you know, help us figure out how to talk about it. And I was so vindicated because yes, this is a part of our official history and it is a part of the story of America that for a long time felt shameful to people. Mm. Um, so there's that aspect, uh, that, that, that piece of American history that I think people were mm. hungry to learn. Um, because, by the way, there are four million descendants of these quarter so, of a million train so riders. So I read, and you have an afterword, kind yeah. of, and that's that's amazing. Yeah, well, and then and I, I would just say one other thing, which is that I think that the contrast with a with a Native American character who is wrestling with her own historical legacy okay. is um, interesting for people to talk about in yeah. contrast. You've got, you know, the story of Native Americans, which is very complex in yeah. our country and in many countries. The indigenous people are treated a certain and way. And people act as if she had no history. The Pen right. Penobscot tribe and... Yeah, and, that's right. But you have a new book, and the new book yeah. is making its own way yeah. successfully, right this red hot minute. Yeah. It is a fictionalization of the life of Christina Olson. <laughs> the coincidence there is just <laughs> too rich. Well, again, but it's nevertheless. not a coincidence. I think the <laughs> fact that she's named Christina is part of my. Yeah. She is the girl in the Andrew Wyeth painting, Christina's World, which everybody knows. I mean, everyone, everyone alive has seen that painting. And of course, it's the, it's the, it's she was real. And you. T speak of her as Wyeth's muse, and muse is just one of you know one of those odd words. Yes. I mean, what she he was a painter before he met her. He painted all kinds of stuff, but something about her and their relationship made that painting. Yes. Yes. So what I will say that's funny about this story is so Christina's world. Some of you may not know is a painting that Andrew Wyeth did when he was in his early, he was 31 years old. Yeah. Um, and she was much older at the time, 55. Um, but he paints this young woman in the field in a pink dress looking at this bleak house in the distance. And I had grown up kind of knowing about the painting, um, but I, I had all these echoes in my own life. Um, it sh the painting was done about an hour from where I grew up in Maine. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I'd grown up with it. My name is Christina. My own grandmother, Christina, was born within a few years of Christina Olson. And I'm the third Christina in my family. So my grandmother is Christina <laughs> Curtis. Um, and they had very similar rural upbringings. And they, they both were precocious early readers. And they both um, ended up taking care of their families at a young age. Both of them had a debilitating illness. So I drew on all of that as I was creating this character. And what's interesting about the story, as opposed to Orphan Train, is that um, I, I had to go completely internal. Um, this woman lives in a small place and doesn't really leave. And oh. in Orphan Train, they have this great expanse of traveling right. the country. You do. It is finally learned at the end of her life, and certainly in since, what her ailment was. But there was no, it was a, uh, was it an enzyme deficiency? I forgot. So it's a degenerative disease called CMT, which I've since learned affects one in 2,500 people. Ah. And I've spoken all over the country about this book. I went on like a two month book tour, and 12 people came up to me who, had, who have CMT. Um, well, and some neurologists too. Sure. It's called Charcot-Marie Tooth. It's a degenerative muscular disease similar to cerebral palsy. So they didn't know what it was and there's still not a cure for it. Right. But it was a frightening disease to have because it's, it, you know, it's degenerative and it gets worse as it goes. At first, when she's a girl, she walks awkwardly, she trips easily, she falls down, she hurts herself. At some point, I will confess, 
I thought, it's time now for crutches. Then yes. I thought, it's time now for a wheelchair, a walker, and then maybe a wheelchair. And if it were I, I would. Exactly. But she is a stubborn woman. Well, so the crazy thing about this book, and, I, and really I... She crawls, is my point. She crawls. <laughs> she pulls herself along later in life. Yeah, yeah. So this book is 100% true in terms of every fact in the book, as, yeah. m cl as close as I could do it. Um, I inhabit her, it's her story, so I tell uh -huh. that. And that's fiction. But the book sure. itself is factually accurate. And she was a stubborn woman. Oh. So I really tried to get that across. And here, here's, here's something that I noticed that uh, I, don't, I wouldn't call this a contradiction exactly, but it's, a, it's an interesting pairing. On the one hand, this house has no electricity, mm -hmm. no indoor plumbing, <laughs> no central heating. On the other hand, she's reading Dickinson, Tolstoy, Cather, and Wharton. Yes. She's a sophisticated, in a way, she's literate, clearly, yes. And, yes. and has an aesthetic and lives in a most primitive fashion. And I, I thought to myself, all right, that's good. Reading's good. Hot water is good, too. I know. Why, but why, 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 so, does she, why does that place never get, I mean, I know they were poor, but really. Right. So, you know, um, there's a whole ethos in Maine of sort of people who do this very back to the land kind of living. And one of the books that was helpful to me is uh, a family in the 1940s. It's called We Took to the Woods. And they just decided to go in and not have any modern amenities. And Christina and her brother Alvaro really lived that way, wanted to live that way, had a sort of simplicity to their lives. But at the same time, as we all know, that creates its own hardship. Oh, yeah. And you know, in real life, Andrew Wyeth and Christina Olson did have this very intimate, interesting relationship because he was like that too. When he married his wife and they had two children, they were living in a horse barn. And his yeah. wife finally got <laughs> mad at him and said, we have to move into a house. And he said to Christina, my wife is so bourgeois. She wants to live in a house. You, 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 have, you have it in the book that Andrew Wyeth and his wife live in a barn, in a horse barn, in two stalls. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he was like, what's wrong with that? What's That's wrong? perfectly <laughs> fine. And he too was um, a sort of autodidact. I mean, Christina was kept out of school at the age of 12. Her, her teacher said, went to her father and said, this is the most brilliant child I've ever taught. I'd like her to take over the school in a few years. Yes. And he said, nope, no. she's needed on the farm. No, it was, these people are rural capital R, U, R. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, these are really, really not, these are hard country people. That's and, right. And Swedish? Yes. Yes. The, Swedish uh, on one who, side, right. Sailor who comes Very ashore. Very shrewd father who, who figured out how to make it in America. One thing, in, in a way, this is a quiet novel mm -hmm. as, right. as, as, a, as a literary term. I mean, nothing explodes exactly. Right. But there is a heartbreak. Walton, and I have to confess, I mean, I, I don't think we're spoiling this for people exactly because it's not right. a, not a tell detective right novel. Yeah. But I, I thought he was going to be all right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was as fooled as Christina was, and then he just couldn't do it. So part of the problem with writing a novel about real people yeah. who lived, and some of whom are still alive, People, oh. Characters in my novel are still alive. If Walton's still alive, we should go find Walton him and punish him. Walton is not, him. but his <laughs> relatives are. All right. um, and in fact, a woman in an audience did all this genealogical research for me, and I have this document of all about his real life. And uh -huh, he, uh -huh. it, it, he really did that. If I had oh, been yeah. making him yeah. up, I would not have spread that love affair out over four years. That's a long time to break someone's heart. Oh, it, it, it was. It was. Yeah. It was devastating. And I think all the more so, m m more terrible, more painful, because it was so unlikely yes. that she would find love. And so it was, she was, she was. It was so clear that this was her last. Yes, effort, only first, really. last, yes. only. Yes, I mean, this was it. It's like you have one, it, you it, have one shot. It, it was <laughs> just, just an awful shame. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, part of my, so here, let me tell you this, which you might not have noticed in the novel. I structured it as four love affairs. Her first love affair is with her grandmother. Her sure. second is with Walton. Her third, of course, is with her brother Alvaro, that they have this very intense relationship. And then her fourth is with Wyeth. Andrew Wyeth yes. transformed her life. And I felt that I had to find hope 
and meaning in this woman's complicated life. And so for me, this became a sort of meditation on what it means to be human. I was, I was a little put out with her when, <laughs> when she, in a sense, squashes Al's possibility for yes. love, family, marriage. I mean, he, he really, he meant to move out into the world a little bit or bring his wife home, whatever, yes, however he yes. would have done it. But he meant to have a kind of life and she sort of uh, sabotaged. sabotaged that. And yeah. He had to stay and okay, in the end, I think he was reconciled to it. But that's right. you're from the same town as Stephen King. Are you two the, the, the main writers? Uh, the main, main writers. <laughs> of that town? Maybe so. His sons are writers. Um, yes. Joe Hill, goes by his middle name, writes thrillers and is very successful. And Owen King, uh, Owen and Steve uh, just did a book together that is just coming out. And, um, and they're both wonderful. Um, uh, but Stephen King is an incredible role model. It's, what it's what just, a life. It's just amazing. It's, that's a coincidence, even more wonderful than the others. Yeah. We have zero time left, Yes. but what are you writing now? My new novel is The Hidden Story, again, of the convict women who transformed Australia. Oh, It's how a nice. really big story, and it's very exciting. Well, we know that there was Botany Bay. We know there were Australians. We know they were convicts. That's right. That's right. But no one ever imagines that they were women, but this it, will work. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Christina, thank you very much. This, is, this has been a pleasure. It's been great. Thank